Okay. Well, we got <laughs> one person here. <laughs> but uh, uh, just going to keep believing that there's people watching the recordings out there. I'm not sure it's been a bunch of people. <laughs> um, yeah, so Schopenhauer as educator, the reading for this week. Um, it's a strange text to teach in a university course, <laughs> but also, I guess, for the same reason, a really important text to teach in a university course because of what it says about, quote, university philosophy. <laughs> uh, and especially what it says insofar as the content of university of philosophy is the history of philosophy which is obviously what the content of this course is and but moreover it's the content of what basically all my courses great so like i said i'm teaching philosophy of science next quarter but philosophy is, when i teach philosophy of science it's about uh, history of philosophy of science you know, from like the 1930s to the 1960s or something. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, now, I mean, what Nietzsche says about this is, well, first of all, not positive, obviously. <laughs> um, but um, but it, it's a little bit complicated. Um, so, I mean, at the time he wrote this, he was teaching in a university. Um, and he does at one point say, we scholars, this is on page 184, but even Kant was, as we scholars are accustomed to be, cautious, subservient, and in his attitude towards the state without greatness. Right, he's talking basically about the uh, the way Kant's religious philosophy was, you know, he kind of got in trouble, so he promised not to do anything, not to publish anymore, and then kind of did after all. Kind of, you know, like I don't know if I think it's probably right to say that his conduct was without particular greatness in that respect. Um, but um, but anyway, you know what I'm interested in is the phrase "we scholars." So Nietzsche is putting himself in the category of scholars. Now, um, however, I think uh, it's important that although Nietzsche was teaching in a university, he was not teaching philosophy. He was teaching philology, um, and he makes a dis a distinction in that respect in this very passage, well, I guess it's a little bit later on, page 186. Um, so, uh, The learned history of the past has never been the business of a true philosopher, neither in India nor in Greece. This depends what you mean by learned. I mean, there's a lot of history in Aristotle. This is a lot about his predecessors and whatever. Okay, but anyway, neither in India, or maybe he's not counting Aristotle, <laughs> neither in India nor in Greece. And if a professor of philosophy involves himself in such work, he must at best be content to have it said of him, he is a fine classical scholar, antiquary, linguist, historian, but never he is a philosopher. But then he adds, and that as remarked is only at best. For most of the learned work done by university philosophers seems to a classicist, and again, I think whenever it says classicist, he says philologist. I didn't check. But so anyway, seems to a classicist to be done badly, without scientific rigor, and mostly with a detestable tediousness. 
Right, so I, that is, I think, um, you know, what Nietzsche is saying here is that, apparently he's saying that uh, philologists can usefully teach the history of philosophy in a university as like a branch of uh, history, uh, linguistics, whatever, um, but a philosopher can't. Um, because a philosopher really has no business with a scholarly treatment of the history of philosophy. Right? You know, I mean, I I think, well, nothing is clear. I was gonna say something like clearly Nietzsche doesn't think a philosopher has no business with the history of philosophy of any kind. <laughs> I mean, you know, you would have to say clearly because uh, because Nietzsche is interested in the history of philosophy. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, may, but maybe actually that's not such a straightforward argument. But in any case, um, uh, but uh, what a, a philosopher can't have the type of interest in the history of philosophy that would make us uh, legitimate scholarly members of the university. <laughs> and when we try to do it, we do it badly. <laughs> so, um, now, I mean, I don't know, that leaves some loose ends that I'm not still not sure just about this one passage, right? Because going back to we scholars are usually cautious and subservient. But Nietzsche is, again, at this time as a philologist teaching in a university, but he doesn't seem to be very cautious and subservient. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I mean, okay, it's true, he did leave the university. But as I pointed out last time, it, you know, it seems that he kept teaching as long as he could, as his health permitted. I, you know, but I guess maybe that's not clear any more than the facts about his, his mental breakdown are clear. I don't know if you looked into it. Um, um, okay, so anyway, I, like it's, a little bit uncertain exactly what Nietzsche thinks is the problem, what can't be taught in the university and what can. Um, and uh, um, But there's definitely some problem with teaching philosophy in the university, that's for sure. And, um, and he says, well, so he, he spends a lot of time explaining why the philosopher can't work for the state. Um, so, of course, like, I mean, this is a public university, right? So I do work for the state. <laughs> I work for the state of California. In fact, when, uh, you, um, when, you, when you get hired, you have to swear to protect the constitution of the state of California against all enemies from the state. <laughs> yeah. <Wow. laughs> And that's apparently something that dates from the Reagan era. <laughs> that is Reagan as governor of California era. Uh, but uh, yeah, in any case, yes, we do work for the state. Uh, so, um, um, but there are, you know, private universities also. But um, um, some of the reasons that he gives why the philosopher can't teach, can't work for the state seem to apply just as well to a private university as to a public university. So, and in particular, this one, which I, I always find the most um, uh, most what. This is the one that really gets to me, I think, right? Quite, this is also on page 186, farther up. Um, 
the state compels those it has chosen to reside in a certain place, to live among certain people, to undertake a certain activity. They are obliged to instruct every academic youth who desires instruction and to do so daily at certain fixed hours. Thankfully, I only have to teach twice a week, but <laughs> not daily, but I think the same issue nevertheless applies. Question, can a philosopher really undertake with a good conscience to have something to teach every day? And to teach it to anyone who cares to listen? Right, that is, he's saying that, that, that the whole enterprise is a bad thing. I say I'm going to appear at a certain hour, um, you know, on a certain day and have and think something. A philosopher can't promise that. Now, I mean, it doesn't exactly explain why a philosopher can't promise that. I mean, I think if you if you looked into it, um, you would have to say it's because what the philosopher is doing when speaking to students is philosophy, right? Like, in other words, if a chemistry professor promised to show up at a certain day and make a chemical discovery at a certain hour, they couldn't promise that because, you know, that's, it's hard. That's why it's hard to be a chemist, right? Like maybe it will work and maybe it won't. But they can promise to show up and teach chemistry every day because teaching chemistry isn't chemistry. Um, right, and, and that's also why he, why the objection he entertains in the next paragraph, but you will object, he is not supposed to be a thinker at all, but at most a learned presenter of what others have thought. Now, I mean, um, so that, that's like specifically aimed at the idea that what philosophy professors teach is the history of philosophy, like what I teach. But, uh, but, you know, I think it could be broadened. It doesn't necessarily have to be a presentation of what people a long time ago thought. It doesn't even necessarily have to be a presentation about what other people thought. It could be a presentation of what I thought once, right? But the main point is that I wouldn't be promising to think anything that I'm just going to give a learned presentation of it. Um, so, uh, um, so what he's saying is that nothing like that can, could count as teaching philosophy. Teaching philosophy has to be philosophy, right? Like think about Socrates teaching or whatever it is he's doing. He says he's not teaching, of course. <laughs> but think about, you know, Socrates teaching philosophy. It's not like he did the philosophy some other time and now he's teaching it. That is the philosophy. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think that's at least the idea of philosophical teaching that Nietzsche is implicitly appealing to when he's saying that, that this is just impossible. You must be, um, um, uh, yeah, you're acting in bad, you're, you're acting in bad faith. You can't promise this. So, um, and as I said, like whether you're working for the state or not doesn't seem to matter in that respect, right? If you're working for Harvard University, I don't know, you still have to promise to show up at a certain time. You know? So, and even the other things that he goes on to add, like, for example, so, I mean, actually, I guess in the text, this actually comes first. It's before the passage I was just reading, where he says, uh, bottom of page 185, 
It is the state which selects its philosophical servants and which selects just the number it needs to supply its institutions. It therefore takes on the appearance of being able to distinguish between good philosophers and bad ones. And even worse, it presupposes that there must always be a sufficiency of good philosophers to fill all its academic chairs. It is now the authority, not only with regard to the quality of philosophers, but also in regard to how many good philosophers are needed. <laughs> right? So, um, so, you know, you might think something like, well, but you know, now with academic freedom, um, we have a way around that. The state doesn't get to say who's a good philosopher and who isn't. Um, it's, you know, uh, it's really in one way or another, it's like, it's based on peer review. Um, you know, that's, It's complicated. They don't just ask the philosophy department, who do you want to hire? And, and then say, OK, we're hiring them. That's not the right word. Right? Like, ultimately, the decision is made farther up in the administration. Um, but, uh, but yes, on the one hand, it's, it's, it's philosophers who you know, like decide who the top candidates are, invite them out, rank them, all that. You know, like, and moreover, like a big part of deciding who the top candidates are is, well, really have, to, have they been published in good journals? So that like that, to get published in a good journal, your article has to be reviewed by, you know, anonymously by other philosophers. And so you might think, well, you know, I mean, it still doesn't answer the, the question of how many should there be. That's, that's, Still out of the hands of philosophers, right? Whether they're working for a private university or a public university. But you might think they're kind of, you know, there's a way to, um, at least the way things are actually done, it's not actually the state deciding um, or the, you know, whatever. Um, Board of Overseers of Harvard University or whatever are not really deciding who's a good philosopher and who isn't. But I mean, first of all, that must have been true in Nietzsche's time too, right? Like, in other words, at least for the most part, you know, I mean, it's not like the Prussian minister of whatever could literally had time to figure, you know, decide who the good philosophers were, who the bad philosophers were. Presumably, he had to ask philosophers for advice, right? So, um, um, I mean, it, you know, it's it's more formal now, maybe, and therefore, like, on the one hand, less corrupt, although on the other hand, also more superficial, <laughs> uh, right? Because, you, you know, you don't ask the people who know them really well. And who you know well, right? You don't go through personal connections, uh, so um, so therefore it's less corrupt. But as I said, also perhaps more superficial. But in any case, leaving all that aside, what about these these peers? They're also kind of institution, right? Like the so-called other philosophers, taken collectively, they're an institution with certain interests. Um, and the interest of that institution may not align with the interest of wisdom any more than the interest of the state align with the interest of wisdom. So, um, so there again, I think Nietzsche is, um, is pointing to a problem about teaching of philosophy in a university. Um, which um, maybe it doesn't make that much difference exactly how the university is organized and whatever, as long as it actually is a university. What, are, what is a university? Um, so university, 
This is something I learned from Adam Smith, by the way. Um, so, like, in the Middle Ages, the universitas, like, this was, this was, like, basically a, an early term for what we call a corporation. And it specifically was a, a kind of corporate entity that was like a guild. So you would talk about like the university of butchers of you know such and such a town or whatever and so what we call a university was originally the university of scholars of oxford <laughs> or the university of scholars of paris right because rather than in the pre-scholastic period you know the instruction was individual you have to go find someone you have to pay them directly and whatever but they they organized into a corporate body for the purpose of collecting tuition <laughs> um, and uh, and that's what we still have <laughs> it's a little more complicated now but that's basically what um, still have right so um so yeah, so anything that's really a university is going to have this problem, like no matter who runs it. Um, and then that might also apply to this other thing Nietzsche says. This is earlier in the essay on page 148. Um, It may be that a man who sees his highest duty in serving the state really knows no higher duties. This is, the, <laughs> this is actually really funny. But there are men and duties existing beyond this. And one of the duties that seems, at least to me, to be higher than serving the state demands that one destroy stupidity in every form, and therefore in this form too. <laughs> so, I mean, it's uh it's funny but it's i mean i think it's already clear this will become clearer in zarathustra but i think it's already pretty clear here that he's really not saying that um <clears throat> that the state is a fine thing for some people to serve but it won't work for philosophers I mean, he is saying that in a way, but but beyond that, he's saying that really serving the state is stupid, and that's why philosophers shouldn't do it. Um, and I'm sure he would say the same thing about uh, any kind of private fee collecting corporation. I mean, remember the things he says about the money economy in this essay. So. Um, um, So, okay, like there, th those are three reasons why a philosopher can't teach in university. Philosopher can't, teaching philosophy should be doing philosophy and you can't promise to do it at a certain time and a certain place with just any audience, et cetera. Um, uh, um, no institution can be set up that will be an authority on who's a good philosopher at the moment. Yeah. So I guess like since the establishment of universities, have there been like any significant uh, philosophy teachers who actually do this, this kind of philosophy, just teach like a big? In universities or outside of universities? I, I guess in, because I mean, it really does, like it makes sense, but it seems so boring to how we think about learning philosophy. Um, well, so like throughout a lot of the modern period, a, a lot of important philosophers have not taught in universities, right? Including uh, most of the ones that we read in this course. I mean, Schelling was, you know, a professor in a university, but uh, Emerson was not, Fuller was not, Coleridge was not. Uh, uh, and Emerson did lecture. Of course, you know, had his uh, 
well, he lectured too, but he also had, you know, his like, uh, um, his journal that he was, you know, promising to publish that people had subscribed to. <laughs> and I mean, and Nietzsche also, although he didn't, so like, well, I don't know if people, I don't, I guess, I don't think people subscribe to the whole series, but he this he promised a series of like 13 untimely meditations, and he only ever wrote, wrote four. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so I guess I think maybe I mean it's a good question, but I think maybe the answer would be in some sense. No, there's never been another Socrates since Socrates. <laughs> right, right. Um, even Plato didn't teach philosophy that way. Except maybe, you know, like the Ajis, the Cynic, who Plato supposedly called the crazy Socrates. Um, <laughs> but uh, so like Socrates gone wild. <laughs> but um, uh, So you might say at least at least the logical extension of what I was saying would be like, well, yeah, you can't teach philosophy in a university. You can't teach philosophy on lecture circuit. You can't teach philosophy by, by publish by having a contract with a publisher. You can't, you know, you can't teach philosophy in writing, which is what Socrates said. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, because it, it really does seem strange to imagine like a philosophy teacher just telling you what they think is true. Ah, uh, well, that's not what Socrates did, right? He didn't just tell you what he thought was true. Oh no, right. I, I don't mean yeah. just Socrates, but just he you know, must have thought about the the structure that he is going to go through the approach that person before. <laughs> I, yeah, I guess, right? So, I mean, okay, so, like, I don't know about the historic Socrates, but the Socrates and Plato's dialogues, uh, no, I think there's some clear points where, where the character could have given a different answer, and Socrates kind of indicates that, but, you know, so, but since, you know, like, that's what you said, I'm going this way. So, um, yeah, I don't, um, again, whatever the real Socrates was, I mean, the real Socrates was obviously very impressive somehow. <laughs> um, how much he was like Plato Socrates, I, uh, I'm not sure I can say, but, uh, um, but Plato Socrates is not just running through a pre-established script. Doesn't know what the what the, the interlocutor is going to say. Um, yeah, yeah. So no. So again, so it wouldn't be. I mean, okay, so first of all, there have been a lot of philosophers actually who have lectured and their lecture consisted of just telling people what they think was true in universities and outside of universities. Uh, that, that's, uh, is that less common now? Maybe. Maybe no one feels they have the authority to do that now. They just have to present different views in the literature or something. I don't really want to cut him as a philosopher per se, but I guess that's kind of like what Jordan Peterson does. You know, he's like giving opinions. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, that's kind of, I mean, whether it's a good example or not, I don't know. It's kind of an example of what Hume calls the easy philosophy, um, or the, the popular pleasant philosophy, as opposed to, you know, I mean, we have, we, I think we have, we have other examples of that. 
And you always think of Dan Savage in this context, actually, even though you might not think of him as a philosopher. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I don't, but it, is it really true now that you can't go to a lecture anywhere in the philosophy department where the person will just stand up and tell you, this is my view? If so, that's not, that is not always true in universities or anywhere else. Yeah, I, I mean, um, that's a further weirdness. Um, well, well, okay, I'm getting kind of sidetracked from talking about Nietzsche, but I mean, but as I said, like one reason it's important to teach this text, I think, is because a lot of times we don't stop to ask whether this could be an appropriate setting for philosophy that we're in. <laughs> and it's not at all clear. I think, I mean, I think as a, you know, since Plato, it always has been not at all clear. And that's, I think that's one of the themes of Plato's dialogues, right? That like he, you're supposed to, you're supposed to, or anyway, if you want to get the full meaning out of it, you have to keep in mind that Plato is not Socrates. Not necessarily in the sense that Socrates thinks one thing and Plato thinks, you know, Socrates thinks A and Plato thinks not A. But just in the sense that, you know, Plato's life is completely different from Socrates' life. His mode of teaching is, you know, everything is different. Um, all right, anyway, uh, sorry, how do I get back to talking about Nietzsche? Well, right, so I was listing those three reasons he, he gives that seem to me, but I think your question raises an issue about this. Like maybe if you really go too far, in the, in, like maybe the, because I was just basically saying, well, a private institution has the same problems as a public institution. But it might, in that case, be hard to draw any line at all between, like, isn't Emerson or even like Thoreau living by himself next to a lake writing something? Are they still kind of part of an institution? Yeah. Um, so maybe that has to be thought out better. But in, but, but in any case, you know, I mean, we certainly have universities now that appear to have all the types of pathology that, that Nietzsche is talking about. Um, so, um, but there's also another part to this, which, and this one maybe is more specific to the idea of the university as a state institution, um, or, you know, I keep talking about private universities, but it's important to remember that public universities are, are largely supported. Sorry, private universities get a lot of money from the public, where I think wherever they exist um, these days. So, well, but anyway, so his question, he says, well, um, why would the state want or encourage uh, young people to study philosophy, especially the history of philosophy. Now, I mean, I, so I guess he's talking about a system where actually where philosophy is one of the required subjects for everyone in the university and they have to pass a public examination on it. We don't have a system like that, at least in this country now. So again, maybe to make this seem to attach to us, you have to like, Make an analogy that might be more or less weak. Like, why does you know why does the state even permit the young to study the history of philosophy? You might ask. That's not as as strong a question as why does it force them to? But in any case, so um, he says uh, this is on the top of page one eighty seven. What in the world have our young men to do with the history of philosophy? Is the confusion of opinions supposed to discourage them from having opinions of their own? Are they supposed to learn how to join in the rejoicing at how wonderfully far we ourselves have come? 
Are they supposed even to learn to hate philosophy or to despise it? Um, right, so a suggestion is here, you know, so I guess, so the question would be something like, um, I think in the context, in this part of the text, the question, you know, like, so the, the first question was like, how can the philosopher claim to do the type of teaching that is philosophy in the university? And the objection was, well, no, that's not what they do. They teach the history of philosophy. And then Nietzsche said, well, number one, they're not really qualified to do that. They don't do it very well. <laughs> and if they did do it well, they wouldn't be philosophers, they'd be philologists. But number two, um, why do we want to teach young people the history of philosophy? So, you know, so he's, I, these questions, I guess there's kind of, well, I don't know if they're just rhetorical questions, but at least he's hinting very strongly that the answer to them is yes, right? That like the reason we want to teach young people the history of philosophy is because through the confusion of opinions, they'll be discouraged from having their own opinion. <laughs> right. So, like, before you study philosophy, the history of philosophy, you might think, uh, oh, does the external world exist? That's an interesting question. Let me think about it. After you read enough the history of philosophy, you're like, oh, that's a really hard question. I don't want to think about it. Right. So, um, and, uh, and not just hard, but also you realize how many different things all seemingly absurd have been said about it. Right. So, um, uh, and number two is to make them say, well, thank heavens we don't live in those bad old times when they have those philosophers. <laughs> and number three, it's to make them hate and despise philosophy. So, you know, I want to say, no, that's not why. <laughs> right? I want to say that that uh, um, young people don't need any discouragement from having their own opinions because they're already discouraged from having their own opinions by the belief that they have an opinion already. <laughs> so they think they know what they think about this. And the confusion of opinions is supposed to show that so going back to that other example you know before you thought oh does the world exist oh i could probably figure it out in an afternoon or you're like oh yeah i believe it does you know or i believe it doesn't i believe that everyone has their own reality here or whatever right but is that really you <laughs> is that your opinion or is that just something you heard about it? so i mean it's certainly my experience that if you ask students straight out a question about ethics or metaphysics or whatever, the answers you get are likely to be kind of, you know, not expressions of actual personal opinions, but kind of what people start saying about this, right? Whereas if you ask them, what did they card first? <laughs> then not only might you get a good account of what Descartes means, but you might even actually get them thinking something <laughs> they're afraid. So like, yeah, so, so that's what I want to say, you know, to Nietzsche, and that, that would be kind of like possible justification for the whole practice. But then you have to admit, like, is a university a really place, a place where you can teach people that? I mean, like, we can't put that on a list of learning objectives. To come to know your own ignorance. They, like I tell, I can tell you from experience actually that administrators will just laugh at you if you bring that. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, could people be graded based on demonstrating their that they become aware of their ignorance? <laughs> like. Uh, 
Yeah, so I don't know. So I don't have a, I don't have a, like, I'm not going to end this with a grand justification of why we should study Nietzsche at a university when he says that you can't study the history of philosophy in university. <laughs> but, uh, um, But it would be even worse. I guess all I can say is it, studying the history of the uh, philosophy in the university would be even worse if we didn't do this. <laughs> so, yeah. So who was he writing to? What was he writing for then? That yeah. Nietzsche. So it's just like his own notes for himself or something. You know, he says about Schopenhauer that he writes for himself, and that's why he's so honest. He doesn't say that about himself. In this essay, I'm writing for myself, and that's why I'm so honest. Um, uh, I so the subtitle of Thus Spoke Zarathustra is a book for everyone and no one. <laughs> so at that point, he definitely is asking that question that you're asking and giving a characteristically hard to understand the answer. <laughs> but, um, you know, but it, yeah, it is possible that one reason he didn't continue the series of the untimely meditations is that he realized that he wasn't sure who he was writing this for. That's possible. Um, um, I mean, he does talk about who he's writing it for, you know. He's yeah, he does say he's writing it for young people who, you know, who feel fed up with this university philosophy, and, you know, so I mean, um, and they want to know what, what they should do, and, you know, but, um, but I think, I mean, it's also part of Zarathustra's evolution, as we'll see when we get to that in the next week, when we get to the first reading that, you know, Zarathustra, when he first comes down from his cave, tries to speak to everyone, and then uh, he ends up concluding, I am not the mouth for these ears. <laughs> and then he says, I, you know, well, then there's a part where he's only, his only companion is a corpse. And then he says, <laughs> now I realize what I need to find is companions. And he, and he finds companions slash disciples, and there's a whole part of the book when he stays with them, but eventually he leaves them. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess all I can say is that this is something Nietzsche is worried about. <laughs> but what his final answer is, it's hard to say, just like it's hard to say about almost anything. Um, okay. So I did feel like I needed to spend a lot of time talking about that. I hope I didn't spend too much time talking about it. It's not exactly the main topic of the essay, right? I mean, although it, it takes up a lot of volume in that essay, it's really discussed, I guess, in connection with the fact that Schopenhauer was not a university philosopher. Um, and that Nietzsche is saying that that's part of what allowed him to be honest and so forth. Um, um, Schopenhauer did have a thorough university education in philosophy, actually. He doesn't, he wasn't like a didactic or something, he didn't teach him a lot in a university. Um, okay, so anyway, that's why this comes up here. Um, I mean, That's, I guess I would say that's not necessarily why Nietzsche is so interested in it, but that's why it comes up in this essay, right? So what is the main topic of the essay? Um, well, it's something about, and this is the question that I mentioned last time will be coming up this time on page 129 um, near the top. There's a paragraph that starts, but how can we find ourselves again? How can man know himself? Um, so I think, you know, the essay is largely a consistent answers to that question. 
And that and that question, vaguely speaking, should be familiar from you know what's happened before in the course. And as I I said, you can even you can hear it as an answer to Emerson's question. Uh, where do we find ourselves? Um, although actually, so in so in German, Nietzsche uses the verb finden here in this sentence, but that was not always used to translate Emerson's question: Where do we find ourselves? I'm trying to remember what the word is. Because I, you know, because I've seen the German translation of Emerson that Nietzsche read. I don't remember exactly, but it basically, you know, says something in German. It says something like, "Where do we meet ourselves?" Um, I again, I don't know. Nietzsche did obviously have some ability to see things in English, right? Like he, I mean, he quotes Hume in English. Although actually, that's kind of a mixed bag that case you know this was in the previous essay in the uses and disadvantages he quotes he says Hume but he doesn't realize that he's actually quoting Hume quoting someone else <laughs> or maybe I don't know maybe he just doesn't bother to say that maybe he does realize he doesn't say it he's, but his quote he quotes Hume this is from Hume's dialogues concerning natural religion and one of the characters in Hume's dialogues concerning natural religion quotes uh uh, I think it's called Night Thoughts by Young. Young's first name, but anyway, it's some some poem, and one of his characters quotes it, and Nietzsche quotes it it's in English and says, you know, as Hume says. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so I mean, he possibly he knew that the, the verb in English was was fine, I don't know. In any case, I, I feel like it's, it's, even if it's not a deliberate answer, it's about the same topic <laughs> as that question. Um, um, so, uh, it's a little bit different. Um, I mean, for one thing, Emerson's question is ambiguous in all kinds of ways that Nietzsche's question is. So first of all, Emerson's question has a perfectly ordinary use, um, right? Where do we find ourselves is just a way of saying, where are we? Maybe not the most, I was, I was actually trying earlier to think of, of a situation where that would be a totally natural way of putting it. Where do we find ourselves? Um, he might say something like, okay, but now after we've gone all through all that, where do we find ourselves now? <laughs> that might be, that would be pretty natural to say it in a context like that. So, um, um, right, whereas how do we find ourselves again? I don't think it could be taken as anything other than a philosophical question. Um, um, it's also different because Emerson's question kind of seems to assume that we have found ourselves, right? It says, where do we find ourselves? Um, now, actually, I mean, I'm inclined to think that it seems to mean that, but it really doesn't. So it's actually, that's actually another way in which Emerson's question is ambiguous. Like it's true, where do we find ourselves in the ordinary? You would ordinarily think it means that we have found ourselves, and the question is, where did we find ourselves? But I think um, the way Emerson is using it there, it means more like, what is the site of the activity of finding ourselves? And the site is bad, right? That's the whole point of that first part of experience. The site is wrong somehow. And so the finding ourselves doesn't exactly succeed. We, um, I mean, the English words couldn't normally mean that. 
but I think they could mean that for anything, right? Like in England, you would normally have to say something like, where do we try to find ourselves? Right? Or, you know, where do we where do we carry out the activity of, or you'd say, where do we seek ourselves or something like that? But I, but, uh, but I think that for Emerson, I think it does mean like, where do we carry out our act of transcendental reflection, whether successfully or not, <laughs> another way of putting it. And the answer is not, right? Because for Emerson, the answer is at least at the beginning of experience, the answer is not. Um, so, uh, uh, so I think actually, if anything, Nietzsche's question is a little bit more optimistic than Emerson's question. <laughs> Nietzsche's question at least um, contemplates that there might be uh, um, a method. Right, that there might be a way we can take to find to, to writing this situation. We have we're not finding ourselves now, but how can we do it again? But again, it's also weird. When did we find ourselves before? I mean, is it you know, it's this picture again, right? But what does this represent? When when was the time we found ourselves before? when we were animals. But at least in this essay, Nietzsche says that the animals are characterized by not knowing themselves. Um, and that it makes, as opposed to the herds we heard about in the previous one here, the animals are beasts of prey and this makes them miserable, not happy. <laughs> they don't know themselves. Um, but um, um, so anyway, I'm not sure exactly how to interpret that again. But he is whatever that again means. He is suggesting that yeah, there might be a way we can do this. And what is the way? So it's confusing because it seems like the essay gives three different answers actually. <laughs> to this. Um, so um, the first one is, you know, is is the official excuse for bringing Schopenhauer in, right? The first answer to how how do we find ourselves is to um, Remember the conditions that have educated us. I guess I should say before I even start on this list that the, that the one that Nietzsche, I think, in agreement with Emerson, thinks that there's no straight or, or well, it doesn't, it doesn't say there isn't, but there's a problem with us, like a straight or direct approach to this issue of finding ourselves. Um, um, right, he is a thing, so how can man know himself? He is a thing dark and veiled. And if the hair has seven skins, man can slow off 70 times seven and still not be able to say, this is really you. This is no longer outer shell. Moreover, it is painful and it is a painful and dangerous undertaking thus to tunnel into oneself <laughs> and to force one's way down into the shaft of one's being by the nearest path. Right? So at least I guess he's not saying it's impossible, but he's saying that it's difficult and dangerous to take a, a direct route to finding yourself. You know, I mean, however you might imagine doing this by introspection or something like that, right? So, um, um, I mean, as I said, I think this is roughly in agreement with Emerson. You know, we find ourselves on this, um, 
Emerson, you know, describes it as the stairway where we, you know, we don't remember how we got there and there's all these steps below us and steps above us and um, we're disoriented. We don't know what to do to try to find ourselves in this situation. So, so, so Nietzsche is, is agreeing with that, but saying, oh, but we have these um, other like indirect ways of getting at it. Right? So, the, so the first one is remember the conditions that have educated us. And that, as I said, that's why Schopenhauer comes in because Schopenhauer is um, at least an example of someone who has educated Nietzsche or who feels has educated him. Um, this is near the end of the time when he's so positive about Schopenhauer. <laughs> Right, so like he, you know, he says, I trusted Schopenhauer immediate, immediately, and I still trust him just as much now, nine years later. But two years after this, he didn't trust him, <laughs> or so I don't know exactly. But anyway, um, but yeah, so but at this point, he looks he he looks on Schopenhauer as this. Um, um, important. Uh, factor in bringing himself, bringing him to this situation, and, and like, what is this situation? I mean, I guess the situation is the situation of realizing that you haven't found yourself, and that you have to find a way of doing it, right? So, uh, and, and now you say, oh, but how can I possibly do this? And the answer is. We'll go back over the conditions that raise the question. And you'll start to understand who the question was addressed to, basically. When you put it in that abstract way, it's kind of the same as Descartes' strategy in the second meditation. <laughs> uh, uh, even though, of course, Descartes doesn't discuss his educators there. He does discuss them in the discourse on the method, but he doesn't say much about it. Um, uh, but still, like I said, on that abstract level, look into the conditions that raise the question for you, and then you'll see who it was the question was addressed to. That could, that could also describe Descartes' method. Um, Okay, but so in any case, uh, that's one answer. But then another answer comes up um, much later on. At least, at least I take it that this is an answer to the same question. So this is maybe not so clear, but um, so he first asked this. Um, on page, well, I guess he first asked this a little bit earlier, but he first gives the answer on page 160 when he says that, um, um, the person who has been educated in this way and has come to recognize certain things, um, uh, Well, I just, he will at last turn his soul in another direction so that it shall not consume itself in vain longing. And now he will discover a new circle of duties. So if there's this circle of duties, and the duties are, um, To produce, so uh, without saying exactly what this is, yeah, let me just call it the ideal. That is, um, you realize what's happened at this point is you realize that you're not the ideal. Um, but then rather than despairing, you see that as a source of duties, and the duties are involved in 
creating the conditions that will allow the ideal to emerge. Um, Now, um, like I said, it might not be obvious that this is an answer at all to the question of like, how do we find ourselves again, right? This is just a question, answer the question, what should we do? What, what duties should we recognize? Um, but um, um, But I think um, um, in the logic of the essay, uh, I should put that one. To discover what it is that you should do now is to find yourself, right? I mean, it's to find yourself in a practical sense, I guess. Um, so, uh, uh, and what you should do is produce, now what is it that you're producing exactly, or producing the conditions for? So it's apparently, um, so, you might say, you might think, if you read this passage, that um, quickly, that what our duty is is to produce Schopenhauer, like to produce another Schopenhauer. Um, I think that's not exactly right, although I'm not 100% sure of this. I mean, he does talk about it. You know, like another part that I didn't read of the of the discussion of teaching uh, philosophy in the university is like, do we really think the state means to create pre to create the conditions under which another Plato will emerge? Of course not. Right? That's not what they want. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so I mean, I don't know if it makes that much difference, but in any case, I feel like it's not Schopenhauer, but it's what he calls the man of Schopenhauer. And this, as most times in this essay, or anywhere, Man translates the German word mesh, which as I said before, means human being. It doesn't really mean man versus woman. Um, I mean, again, I don't, you know, it's only so far I go and apologizing for Nietzsche along these lines. He, you know, like, as I said last time, he's, he's, he, he isn't, well, maybe I shouldn't say, I think I said something like, he isn't any kind of feminist. Maybe he is some kind of feminist, but if he is, it's a weird kind. <laughs> it's definitely not the kind who would, who would, who would apologize for saying man here instead of woman. Um, so uh right but in any case uh but but the truth is his language doesn't express that uh, right it's the human being of schopenhauer the human being of rousseau the human being of goethe the human being of, Schopen of uh, schopenhauer um, well should I keep saying man therefore, or should I keep changing it to human being? I'm not sure. That, uh, since the translation says man, it would be easier to keep saying man, but maybe that's a bad excuse. In any case, so the ideal is this kind of human being who uh, Schopenhauer somehow uh, Sets up as an ideal, I think. Right? So, compared to the other two, which is Rousseau and Goethe, you know, so like, so like the, the human being of Rousseau or the man of Rousseau is 
someone who is like crushed under the pressure of civilization and calls out to nature to liberate them. So is that Rousseau himself? I mean, that is certainly something someone that Rousseau discusses. Is that Rousseau himself? Like, is that Rousseau of the Confessions? Um, that's, it's a tough question, and it's even tougher to say what Nietzsche, how Nietzsche would answer that, obviously. But I have the feeling that no, it's not Rousseau himself. Rousseau himself is, you know, I mean, he's kind of a misfit in civilization, but he's not literally trying to get out of it. Everything he does is within, you know, writing operas and publishing books. And um, he's, he's not um, himself trying to throw off the social order and return to nature, but he is creating that idea. And it is going to result in, I mean, along with a lot of other things, in various kinds of revolutionary uh, turmoil and so forth. So, um, so, and I think the same thing is true of the man of Goethe. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, I guess I should say maybe like the man or human being of Rousseau, it's not Rousseau himself, but it's not totally different from Rousseau himself. Rousseau himself is suffering under these conditions, you know. Um, and so you could say the same thing about the man of Goethe, you know, like, okay, yeah, Goethe does, you know, like to travel and observe things and whatever, but not the way Faust does. Um, Right, like this is it's a character created by it that embodies this idea. So I think that's what the man or human being of Schopenhauer is supposed to be like. Um, as I said, I'm not sure how much difference it makes. It probably does make a big difference in the man somewhere, but at this point, it probably doesn't make that much difference. The main thing is, well, I mean, okay, here's how it would make a difference. Suppose this were we said this equals Schopenhauer. So in that case, since Schopenhauer was, the, was part of the conditions that educated us, then producing Schopenhauer would be producing ourselves, so to speak. Right? That is reproducing, would be reproducing the conditions that, that, that produced us. Um, not by like conserving them the way the antiquarian historian does, but by producing them in the future, willing them to exist in the future. Um, so, I mean, so, uh, Nietzsche, I think it was in the last essay where he actually, he, he comes close to mentioning the eternal recurrence, but as a like, but as like uh, something that no one would actually say. <laughs> right? Yeah. Do you, do you think that that from Schopenhauer? Because there is some at some point Nietzsche mentions Schopenhauer mentioning the Nirvana, I think. Yeah. Then, um, I think actually that this idea, I mean, and that maybe also is one of the reasons why I wouldn't necessarily identify the man of Schopenhauer with Schopenhauer. So I think, so first of all, I don't know Schopenhauer very well. I've read a little bit of it. I've, I've, you know, I've never read all of the world as well as in representation. I just can't get through it. Um, I, unlike Nietzsche, at least for this period, I don't find there's something about Schopenhauer that kind of uh, repels me rather than attracting me. But in any case, uh, but my, my impression is that this whole idea of like giving ourselves duties so as to produce something in the future and redeem ourselves is something that the thing about Nirvana and Schopenhauer is supposed to involve a rejection. Right. So in other words, even at this point where Nietzsche is 
is still regarding Schopenhauer as his educator, he doesn't actually agree with Schopenhauer about the very thing under discussion, I think. Um, um, so, yes, I don't think he got this from, well, I mean, he's telling us that he, in some sense, got everything from Schopenhauer, well, or among others. Um, right, because, uh, it, it, you know, um, in the first place he mentions Schopenhauer, with the page down, number down somewhere. Yeah, it's the very end of section one, page 130. And so today I shall remember one of the teachers and taskmasters of whom I can boast, Arthur Schopenhauer. And later on I shall recall others. So uh, I'm not sure, I mean, so first of all, there are others. I'm not sure if by later on he would call others, he means that Rousseau and Goethe also are among them, or if he means that Emerson is among them, who he's going to recall later, um, or if he means that some of the later untimely meditations that he never wrote are going to be about some of the others. It could mean any of those things. But in any case, yes, he's not saying that Schopenhauer is the only source, but he is, yeah, he's saying that, you know, in some sense, it comes from Schopenhauer, but it doesn't mean that he agrees with Schopenhauer. Um, so, um, so, I mean, on the other hand, uh, it does seem that the man or human being of Schopenhauer is supposed to be the same as the true men or humans we mentions on page 159. Um, um, they are those true men, those who are no longer animal, the philosophers, artists, and saints. So, I mean, he has a discussion of the difference between philosophers, artists, and saints, which I won't go into, I guess, but, um, but you know, so what we're producing here is we're trying to produce philosophers, artists, and saints. And these are the true humans. But again, it doesn't, you know, the word in German doesn't mean man versus woman. Uh, um, okay, so so all of that is the second answer. I remember I said there was so the, so the so the second answer is that the way to find ourselves is to um, um, take the ideal that we find ourselves falling short of. We're, we're, we're suffering because we can't, I, I mean, I guess to go back to like Shelley terminology, you could say we're suffering because we can't identify our finite selves with the infinite self. It's too far above us, right? And so Nietzsche says, oh, but you can find yourself and this is how you do it. You, you, you set to yourself the purpose of producing the person who will be able to do that. Um, um, and in that way, you, in a sense, do, like you do find yourself in the infinite self. You find yourself in the infinite self by, by um learning to see yourself as the as producing it <laughs> um so uh i mean actually no, i put it that way i'm not 100 percent sure that i should distinguish between these two answers but well let me i'll just i'll just put down 
No, I guess they really are different, but they're, they're, they're related. So the third answer is that this ideal is itself an ideal of self-finding. Yeah, again, uh, we wave uh, right back and forth. Is this just a further explanation of this? Um, but I'll call it two and a half. But <laughs> right, that is that um, the true human. I can say the true humans will do the finding for us. We find ourselves by means of them. Um, so, uh, Right. I think it, it comes out most clearly that that's what this ideal is about, but that's what, you know, because I, I haven't gone into, you know, what is the true human being or the, or the human being of Schopenhauer? What, you know, what is this ideal? So, um, um, so, like, I mean, he says something about it when he first introduces that, which is a little hard to understand, but this is on page 152. He says, um, uh, the Schopenhauerian man voluntarily takes upon himself the suffering involved in being truthful. And this suffering serves to destroy his own willfulness, or like, to, just, to kill his self-will is what it actually says in the original. To, to kill his self-will, destroy his own willfulness. And this suffering, sorry, uh, and to prepare that complete overturning and conversion of his being, which is the real meaning of life to lead up to. So, um, So, I mean, you can already kind of hear that this is about coming to know yourself because it's about the suffering involved in truthfulness, right? And remember from last time we saw, or at least I claimed that, you know, truthfulness and freedom were about being able to be yourself um, or not being self-deceived. That's the sense of truthfulness um, that Nietzsche is really worrying about here. Truthfulness with yourself. So the true humans, or uh, the, the true humans are the, are the truthful humans <laughs> as well, right? They're the ones who um, will be able to take upon themselves the suffering of finding out who they really are. Um, but I think, and this is what I was going to read before, that um, it becomes even clearer when he talks more about this on page 157. This is the part with the, with the, the beast, the beast of prey. Um, pursued through the wilderness by the most gnawing torment, rarely satisfied, and even then in such a way that satisfaction is purchased only with the pain of lacerating combat with other animals, but through inordinate greed and nauseating satiety. Sati, how do you pronounce that word? To hang on to life madly and blindly, with no higher aim than to hang on to it, not to know that or why one is being so heavily punished, but with the stupidity of a fearful desire to thirst after precisely this punishment as though after happiness. That is what it means to be an animal. So, I mean, compared to the herds that are jumping and frolicking in the field, this animal, as I said, sounds really miserable, but nevertheless, it has the same characteristic. The, the misery is being caused by the same thing to cause the happiness. In the other case, it's being caused by just 
blindly going forward and not being able to stop and reflect on what you're doing, right? And then he says, um, and if all nature presses towards man, it thereby intimates that man is necessary for the redemption of nature from the curse of the life of the animal, and that in him existence at last holds up before itself a mirror in which life appears no longer senseless, but in its metaphysical significance. So all nature, like that is all animal nature is pressing forward to the human being, but which human being, not us, right? Because we're still basically involved in this um, blind thirst and hunger and, you know, um, it's all nature is pressing for, to the true human being who, who will finally be able to hold up the mirror reflection. Um, um, and in that way, all nature will be redeemed, Nietzsche says, right? So that's why I said the true humans do, will do the finding for us, like, like by, you know, by them being able to see what the significance of everything is, our life will also gain significance. Um, oh, by the way, I think I should come back to this, but I mentioned the eternal recurrence, right? So, like, um, Nietzsche is not yet thinking, I think, of that, that, the, that the solution to these problems is going to lie in the direction of willing our own reoccurrence in the future. But you can already see what kind of stuff was going to push him in that direction. And the other thing to say about this is that, on the other hand, what he's calling the true humans here it's, our pre, it's pretty clearly a precursor, well, to two different things, the relationship between which is not clear. One is the Superman, right, the Ubermensch, um, that we're going to hear a lot about in Zarathustra. And the other is the philosophers of the future, which, is that going mention in Zarathustra? I feel like it doesn't. Like it's going beyond good and evil. I might be wrong about that. So, but, but, but both of those things, this, the, you know, the Ubermensch and the, philosopher of the philosophers of the future have played the same role of like the master that we're creating for ourselves in the future, but, um, but they, they're acting on our behalf because we produce them. <laughs> um, so, so that structure is already here. The only difference, I think, is that um, so the only I think the only difference is that well there's probably other differences but anyway that a, an important difference is just this terminological difference that here he's refusing to use the term human in a full sense for us and only applying it to these future people. Whereas, um, you know, the Ubermensch terminology reserves the term human for us and, and then calls what he's here by the tree humans, the Ubermensch. Um, I mean, like I said, among other differences. <laughs> um, okay. Um, So, um, so one thing you might say about these three or two and a half answers is that, like, it's really a sequence. I mean, first you do this, and then you do this, 
and then this is the results or or um yeah i guess you'd say this is the result um but uh i think if you take it a little bit more carefully it, the, the picture is more complicated because um, um, because right so we think we're just looking back into the past to see how, let's say, Schopenhauer has educated us. But it turns out that what we discover is how Schopenhauer is going to now educate us. <laughs> right? That's actually how he introduces the question of the circle of duties. Um, Sixty, I think. Um, oh, right. So actually, this is the beginning of section five on page one fifty six. But I have undertaken to exhibit my experience of Schopenhauer as an educator, and it is thus not nearly sufficient for me to paint. And to paint him perfectly, that ideal man who, as his platonic ideal, as it were, holds sway in and around him. Yeah, I guess, I mean, that's maybe the clearest ex um, uh, expression he gives to the question of whether these are the same. They're not the same, but this is like the ideal of this that holds sway in and around him. But anyway, um, the hardest task still remains to say has to say how a new circle of duties may be derived from this ideal and how one can proceed towards so extravagant a goal through, so it says through a practical activity is the translation, but in German it says regelmessische Tätigkeit, a regular activity, a rule governed activity. I don't know why practical activity was. Radio message does not mean practical. I don't know why. <laughs> right. So, in other words, like how one can proceed to so extravagant a goal through a method, in short, to demonstrate that this ideal educates. Right. So, it's like when we look into how we were educated. What we discover is um, what we discover is where that Okay, so we, we, we remember how we were educated by Schopenhauer. What we, the answer that comes out of this is how thinking about Schopenhauer can educate us now. Um, so it's not exactly, so in other words, these aren't exactly two, these aren't Maybe I should have called, called this one and a half, and this one and three quarters, right? I mean, these are not as separate as it might seem on this list. It's not like first you think, okay, I was educated by Schopenhauer, and then you think, okay, well, you know, um, so what have I learned about myself? Well, I, you know, um, learned that I ought to produce the man of Schopenhauer. It's that, you know, in thinking back and how I was educated for Schopenhauer, I learned how Schopenhauer can educate me. And that shows me the way forward. Um, 
And similarly, when you get to this one, so sure enough, these true humans, if they, if we manage to produce them, will actually do this. Um, but, um, but is it really the case that, um, We have to wait for that to happen. I mean, if we're saying that that like because we will to produce these true humans, um, we benefit from their finding themselves. Do we actually have to wait for that to happen? We've already done it. That is, we've go back to the way I was describing in, in Schelling's terminology. Ray, like um, we, you know, in learning how the this apparently finite self that's so far below the ideal can um, actually give itself a duty that will result in producing the idea, or producing the reconciliation with the idea, maybe is the right way to put it. Um, we have already come to reconcile with the finite self and the infinite self. We've seen how the two really can, um, are ultimately the same, because we've understood how the finite self can regard itself as the same as the finite self. There's this indirect means. So, um, um, so that the importance, and I think this this is an important thing to keep in in mind in Zarathustra, that you know, like the importance of the 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 coming of the Superman and the Ubermensch is um, the importance of it always has to do with what it does to our will now to have that to set that as a goal um, In other words, I, I put it a different way. There's, it's really there's there's just one ideal that's that's involved in all three of these steps. You know, here we're remembering it. Here we're like giving ourselves the duty to produce it, and here we're expecting it. Um, but. All three ways, what we're doing is um, making it our ideal and, there, and thereby making ourselves more than just animals. Um, I don't know if that was. Comprehensible or not, although um, I feel like I understand it better than I did last time. Right? <laughs> but so there's one other thing here to say um, in kind of in preparation for the transition to Zarathustra. Um, Nevertheless, it it seems possible to me that even though the way things are presented in this essay, these are really kind of three aspects of the same thing. That in the end, Nietzsche um, started to distrust this answer. I mean, he certainly started to distrust Schopenhauer. And also Wagner, which the last essay, in the, the last untimely meditation is about Wagner. Um, so, uh, um, so if he had written about Schopenhauer even a few years later, 
she wouldn't have been able to use Schopenhauer this way. Um, and uh, so, like, first of all, one one hint that that's going on is, as we'll see, Zarathustra has this corpse for a companion for a while, and then he uh, wakes up in the morning and, and realizes that he says, from now on, I will no longer speak to the dead, but only to the living. And that's when he goes to seek his companions. So um, you might, that might reflect Nietzsche saying, uh, you know, I'm going to stop carrying these corpses around with me. Um, but it also might be somehow related to the beginning of the idea of eternal recurrence, which we'll also see in, well, it doesn't come up immediately at the beginning of Zarathustra, at least not literally, or not explicitly. But um, we'll also see in Zarathustra the idea of the eternal recurrence. And that, you know, means that somehow, like, um, we're going to be the educators of ourselves. We're going to be the conditions of possibility for ourselves. Um, okay, so I guess I'll say more about that next week. We're out of time, and uh, I'll see you then.